Good day and welcome to the Hidebound Convivium for July 26th. Today we're going to be looking over an essay that I've written called The Exceptional Americanism, uh, which is on the topic of sociocultural identity in the United States and certain problems therewith. And uh, it's going to include at the end some concrete solutions for our current moment. And so I hope that uh, it's a helpful video. I know that issues of cultural identity, hereditary identity, are things that uh, generally bother a lot of people on the right wing, myself included. And what, what I've really found through working on this essay in general, I feel like is that a lot of our problems are... Uh, misidentified, I think, and uh, and oftentimes, really, it, there's a kind of self-indulgence that goes along with worrying about these sorts of things, uh, when what we really need to be doing is building and rebuilding. Uh, so that's kind of the energy that I wanted to bring into the essay, and so I want to get people's feedback, thoughts on the pro my presentation of the problem and the solutions, and I definitely hope that somebody smarter than me comes along and restates my words much better than, than I could. But hopefully it's, it's a contribution nonetheless. Uh, right now, coming up on the screen, what you're going to see is the, the uh, new content schedule for the channel. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about the fact that you know the, the channel is growing thanks to some of the influence of the guys on the Discord server for the Canis Society. I've got 10 subscribers now. That's a, that's a big whopping number. I never thought I would have that many. I'm, and I'm, I'm, being, I'm being sincere in that regard. Uh, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to answer um, a call made by the distributist, among other people, that there really isn't a lot of right-wing content that's being serially produced consistently. Uh, at the moment, and so what I wanted to do is allow my channel to be sort of that, um, you know, consistent right-wing content, or one of the channels that's generating consistent right-wing content. Plus, it's just a rule of, you know, manufacturing a good blog is that to keep people interested, to keep readership, or in this uh, sense, viewership, uh, you want to be consistently creating content that people are going to enjoy. And so I'm going to explain the schedule briefly. Uh, on Mondays, there's going to be an episode of the Mo Bible Podcast. It's a Bible podcast. All I do is read uh, between three and five chapters of the Bible, and I talk about it from a layman's perspective. Generally, I bring in some commentary from the Patristic Fathers or somebody like that. And on Wednesdays, I'm going to do an Essays and Featured Content day, and that's going to be for essays either from people who submit to me, for example, via Discord or email, and I'm going to leave the email uh, down in the description, uh, or it's going to be essays or written work from, you know, leaders, thought leaders of the right wing or of the movement, uh, people like G.K. Chesterton, for example, um, and generally what I'm going to try to do is if I'm taking an essay from somebody who's dead or who's a high-profile leader in the movement, I'm going to try to make it resonate with whatever's going on on Friday. Because Friday is the day in which I'm going to post personal content. So depending on what's been going on that week, if I've been writing a lot about different things, it's going to end up being a trad potpourri uh, like was last week. Um, or if it's just one focused um piece of content that's generated around a specific topic, it's just going to be one video essay that is developed by me personally. And all of these things are going to be published between the hours of 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. I really wanted to get this schedule done, finalized, and make sure that I've got the time to do these videos because I want to deliver something quality to my subscribers. Obviously, I want to grow my subscriber base. Uh, but more than that, you know, I just want to make this a concerted intellectual and en exercise for myself. Um, so that's housekeeping things out of the way. Um, before I get into the essay, I want to do a shout out to the various people on the discords, uh, the Canaan Society Discord and, and otherwise, that uh, helped me to refine these ideas and uh, in essence helped me to refine the thesis for this video. 
So without further ado, this is The Exceptional Americanism. The Exceptional Americanism I can't remember how old I was when I first asked the question that all Americans of European descent are likely to ask some time in their life, and I can't remember who I addressed the question to. Nevertheless, the interest in this question and the complicated, often contradictory emotional responses to it has been one of my most pressing concerns, touching on aspects of my cultural identity, spirituality, and conception of society, and my place in it. The question I am speaking of is, of course, where were we from originally? This question, or some permutation of it, is never satisfactorily answered for many. In my case, I was introduced to a genealogical mess on my father's side. The primary branch of my family was definitively Swedish, the one to which I owe my surname. But beyond this, there was my grandmother's family, who were said to have been from Germany, but it was unknown whether they were ethnically German or French. Part of the family was said to be Irish, but whether they were true Irishmen or Anglo or Scotch-Irish Protestants that converted to Catholicism for some reason of expedience before their immigration was never settled. Even less known is my mother's side of the family, who are said to be descended of the first English settlers in the New World, but with little documentation or recollection of the family beyond the fifth generation into the past. The answer, then, to where were we from, or rather the more accurate question, which are the constituent parts of my ethnic identity, was that I was Swedish, slash some variation of Irish, slash German or French, slash Anglo-Saxon with some presumed admixture. Such an arrangement is not uncommon among Americans of European descent, or indeed among Americans as a whole. America truly is a melting pot, not in the poetic sense in which all racial and ideological differences are melted down into a cohesive whole, but in the other sense. America melts down religious and ethnic affiliations not into a rod of steel, but into a heterogeneous sludge. I am convinced that part of the existential crisis of American living is this seminal way in which we all seem to be cleaved from history. Like the new Soviet man, who is said to be divorced from everything men once were, the new American man is disconnected from ancestry and familial creeds. The effect of cleaving people from historical roots, in a sense, is to create a situation in which they cannot escape to a simpler, more easily understood paradigm of ethnic identity. Where, for example, is my homeland? By my primary line, I suppose Sweden, but I can say with some certainty that I am not, nor shall I ever be, Swedish. Then there is the added difficulty of my religion. When I converted to Catholicism, I was distinctly aware that I was the last man in my family line to practice what had been, on my father's side, the ancestral religion. I was the last adherent among my family to the faith of our fathers, so to speak. Being Catholic in the American South is an interesting experience. You learn how out of place one can be, where once, as a Protestant, I could feel myself part of the marginally dominant culture of the area, I at once felt as an outsider when I began to practice Roman Catholicism. And the more I pondered this question, the more I felt a cleave between the South and myself. For was not the South, like much of the rest of the United States, fully dedicated to anti-Catholicism just a few decades prior? Where once I had been an accepted part of the majority, I was now a strange minority, one that for decades had been held antithetical to the place I was from. I could not erase from my mind the growing feeling that in adopting the Catholic faith I had apostatized from the United States. For even though the United States and its people were no longer openly and violently hostile to Catholicism, this did not change the fact that America's original character was anti-Catholic and the respite which the Roman Church had earned in America was solely through waves of immigration bringing sheer numbers of adherents. I felt at once like a traitor and an enemy to the country, despite these long-standing grudges now forgotten. While the Ku Klux Klan and the Know-Nothings were distant vestiges of the past, I couldn't help but think they were more authentically American than myself, that I had no business being who I was, a European mutt in a Catholic to boot, in a country that, up until recently, was settled, built, and occupied by Anglo-Saxon Protestants for themselves and for their posterity, which did not include me. And, of course, there are sidebar comments which might be made to direct such thoughts into increasingly fruitless channels. 
Some will make ahistorical claims that Catholicism was actually deeply influential in the founding of America. This is true in the same sense that Pearl Harbor was deeply influential in the United States entering into the Second World War. Others will say that no matter what, you were born here, your family was born here, and that makes you an American. But does it? Haven't we dismissed the idea of magic dirt for first-generation Americans? Why is it that, upon the second generation, or third, or thirtieth generation, the soil can imbue Americanness into someone who rejects nearly everything America was founded upon? One can also take the tact of, what is ethnicity anyways? Blurring the lines between peoples until they disappear entirely can dismiss the problems of half-breeds who don't fit in by making everyone such a half-breed. But everyone suspects the cheapness and insincerity of such a tact. The opposite extreme, of course, is just as corrosive. One can, out of an obsession with some idea of racial or ethnic purity that canon has never existed, see oneself as the doomed terminus of a hopelessly confused bloodline. One might claim that anyone short of wasp masons with powdered wigs can never be a true American, and that the nation was conquered from without and turned against its founding principles. There is a small degree of truth to the last part, but nevertheless, these extreme understandings also leave one looking at heredity and history as through a glass darkly. As I pitched this idea in my head for the past several days, I found it instructive to look back at the history of America's mother country. Today we distinguish the English as an ethnic group, and yet history and ancestry reveals that the people of England are a product of centuries of invasions and migrations. After the retreat of the Romans, the Celtic Britons were invaded by the Anglo-Saxons, in turn invaded by the Danes, as well as the Normans. Despite extensive settlement by the first three groups in England, over the years they were melded together into a common people, one that is readily identifiable, and one that few, especially among reactionary circles, would claim is merely an arbitrary distinction. In all those centuries, they embraced pagan gods and then tore them down. They embraced Catholicism, and then large numbers of them rejected it. Now they are a thoroughly secular society. The nation has embraced different political systems, philosophies, and regimes. Their outlook as a people has changed radically in all the many ages of their long history. And yet, the English are English. One of the differences between England and America is time. Time to stitch the disparate parts of a fractured land into one people with a common language and cultural heritage. So what if they repudiate the ideologies and beliefs of their fathers? Your father is your father, no matter if you disagree with them. There are elements that can bind people from all over, given enough time, into one. A shared religion or outlook on the world is important, but it seems to me that the most effective means of building such an identity, an intergenerational camaraderie, so to speak, is proximity. Proximity facilitates community, and community facilitates fraternity. People of the same town, the same trade, the same interests and beliefs will coalesce into a singular identity, given enough time, and given the actual ability to see each other face to face. The problem with America is that she is young, only a few hundred years old, and she arrives at a time in world history where it is difficult for people to forget their ties in the old world. One essential component of creating a new people is letting go of the old, something which Americans, myself included, have a difficult time achieving. Additionally, the peoples she tries to unite within herself are often simply too different, either in appearance or in cultural practices they have adopted while here. Both these problems are exacerbated by what I find to be the ultimate obstacle to the construction of a believable American identity, and that is the conditions of modernity. I don't blame modernity to be fashionable, or because the modern world, as a broad concept as it is, is the obligatory reactionary boogeyman. I say this because the conditions of the modern world do everything to thwart this building of fraternity and kinship which Americans so desperately need. I may speak of the importance of connecting with those who are immediately around me, but do I actually interact with the people that comprise my immediate public? Beyond the obligatory commerce and work which is required to keep oneself in food and board, no, not really. The internet makes us islands unto ourselves, and when we do unite with those of the same ideas, people we feel some degree of camaraderie and kinship with, they are separated from us by hundreds or thousands of miles and a screen. Meanwhile, 
all the cultural artifacts that could have been used as a rallying cry or a headquarters for building America have been crushed utterly. Gigantic corporations plasticize the commerce of the country, and media giants sterilize our cultural environment, banishing from the collective consciousness things like folk music and culture, as well as any sort of regional or parochial art. A movie beheld by a small audience in one region of the country is a shared communal experience. A blockbuster seen by everyone from Denver to Albany is merely a product. The failures of popular culture and entertainment to produce a shared cultural heritage rather than a cheap imitation of a, natu of a national culture lies in the fact that any authentic identity is built from the ground up rather than being imposed from the top down. Modernity is, one, is a one-way approach to culture, knowledge, belief, politics, so on and so on, and it effectively cripples the ability of a nation like America, which has, as of right now, the character of many disparate peoples under the dominion of a central government. And it refuses their right to become a people identifiable, like the Russians, the English, the French, and so forth. It is my contention that in the case of an American identity, cultural, at least, if not ethnic, the reason that many people feel American identity is non-existent or impossible is that it has not yet been fully constructed. I must leave aside the fact that most of my own feelings of alienation and despair on this topic, if I'm being totally honest with myself, come not from a true lack of connection to my homeland, but rather the alienation that is part and parcel of modern Western living. I suspect that this is the case with many online reactionaries who, feeling a sense of dislocation and despair with the current order, place the problem at the feet of a confused genealogy rather than the socially fractured way we, that we live. This creates a quandary that presents itself as a unique challenge to the online reactionary community. Too often we are involved with shoring up the defenses of what already is or attempting to chip away with hand tools at the wrought metal of the wrecking ball that progressive forces are using to demolish those defenses. In places like Europe, where there is something definitive that can be looked to and defended, in America, I contend, there is no such foundation. In America, the task is much different. We are required to build identities, build people, and generally be the generative force in the culture rather than the preserving force. America is, as of yet, an unfinished product that, if we are bold, men of the right can seize and guide in a direction that is true, good, and beautiful. To accomplish this, we must abandon certain failed notions of what America is or can be. The national monoculture of gargantuan corporations and the West Coast entertainment industry is not a force for creating a people or an identity. It is a force for breaking such distinctions down. We know this well. The dream of a unified American culture, coast to coast, is as misguided as it is undesirable. America, reflecting its history, is ideally constructed as a confederation of tribes and peoples, from the large and still somewhat pronounced culture of the Old South to the insignificant and rapidly vanishing cultures of people like the Hoy Toiders. The end goal is a nation which is a patchwork of semi-independent, culturally distinct regions that, over the next 100 to 200 years, will develop into distinct identities. In the East, cultural groups like my own, the Southerners, are pretty much already their own coherent cultural group that, nevertheless, needs to start attending to the steps I am about to lay about if it wants to survive. In other portions of the country, many of them still relatively unpopulated and unsettled until a little over a century ago, a great deal of work will be necessary to build the cultural and hereditary identities that will carry them forward as a people. I close this video with a series of steps that everyone can take to rebuild the social fabric of your own region and lay the groundwork for a rich cultural identity that one can pass on to their children and grandchildren. Step 1. Interact in person with your neighbors often. Many modern people live in a state of semi-hibernation inside their houses, leaving only to go to work or to buy things. This habit must be stopped. Going to houses of worship on the appointed days is a start, but it must be a deeper interaction than this. Patronize the local eateries and businesses. Even if they are corporate, they are generally run as franchises, so the store operators will likely be locals. If they are locally owned non-franchise stores, patronize those, even if prices are slightly higher. Go to cultural events like plays, music festivals, fairs, and concerts, and bring your family. Patronize the arts in your community, provided they don't push degenerate ideas. 
If you live reasonably close to town, take walks downtown and speak to people you meet on the street. Be courteous to everyone, especially those who don't share your political opinions. Don't talk politics as a general rule, and never do so in mixed company. Step 2. If you have any artistic talent, set aside some of your time to help build up a cultural base within your community. If you're a writer, write books, essays, short stories, and poetry that specifically appeals to people in your geographic area, deals with their concerns, or at least has some resonant themes. If you're a writer, develop ties with your local newspaper, and perhaps they will give you an opportunity to write small articles on local culture. In my experience, small-town newspapers tend to struggle with content to put on the pages. In a similar manner, buy your local weekly newspaper and read it. This will help with some of the things mentioned in Step 1. If you're a sculptor, painter, etc., try to create art that is, while self-expressive, also edifying to the community. This doesn't mean you have to idealize where you live in your artwork. Most communities have deep underlying problems that can be brought to the fore by the artist who is concerned with building rather than tearing down the cultural fabric. If you're a filmmaker, try making honest documentaries and or films about your town, village, or city. If you're blessed enough to have a small local theater and your work is good enough, they might decide to show it. If you have any kind of talent whatsoever, teaching piano or woodworking, don't let that talent stay idle. Make attempts to share your knowledge with the community. In, ess in essence, this step can be summed up as be charitable with the intellectual gifts God has given you. Step 3. Marry locally if possible. Have children, and raise those children with an admiration and appreciation of where they live. If the streets are sufficiently safe, allow them to walk about and explore the surrounding neighborhood when they are old enough to do so. Foster in them an appreciation of the people around them, the natural setting of your community, and a sense of homeliness. When you speak of their future, tell them about the great things they can offer the community through their own contributions, even if they do have to leave town for education. Try to foster an attitude of, what can I give the world, rather than, what can the world give me? Don't push college on your children. Put off giving your children electronics or unfettered access to the internet. Never allow them unlimited time on electronic devices. Don't allow them to have television sets in their rooms. Attempt to cooperate with other like-minded parents in your immediate vicinity to present a unified front in this respect. Step 4. Put down roots. If you have an extended family congregating in one community, try to congregate with them. Build intergenerational households when possible or practical. Connect the young with the old. Die in the same place you lived and be buried where you died. Not until you're buried in the soil does the soil truly become yours. These are my suggestions for steps that reactionaries and those of a conservative bent can take to fight back against the socio-cultural alienation that is gripping the United States in a peculiar way, and that we may use to rebuild a local culture that is genuine and far more nourishing than the thin gruel of the manufactured national monoculture. We won't live to see the fruits of such labor, but if we are persistent and diligent, perhaps our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will. This has been the Highbound Convivium. Good day.